And here we are on Wednesday night, as ever was in the middle of March, that feels more like the middle of December, January and February put together, on what was apparently called National, National No Smoking Day, or as I prefer to call it, National No Nicotine Day, because I've been severely disappointed by what I've seen both on the telly and on the interwebs during the course of the day. However, I am greatly heartened to have with me via Skype, Clive Bates. Hi Dave. Hiya, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. Very well, how are you? Um, 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 my blood's boiling, so it's what? kind of, it's offset the freezing cold of the building work going on. And in the virtual telly over my left hand shoulder, as per usual, the effervescent loveliness that is Sav. Now, tonight is going to be a little bit different because Clive's with us for the first half of the show and then he has to disappear and do very important things with very important people for very important reasons, which is all good. So in the second half of the show, I'm going to be inviting Dave Kitson to join me and he will be taking your calls. Call VT Talk, I believe is, is where you need to Skype and we'll be bringing the Skype calls in and also I'm going to be playing um, the screen ripped video of Anna Soubry's ESIG presentation to the Lords, which will be marvellous. I'm sure you will agree, or if you've already seen it, perhaps you won't. Anyway, that's all gonna to be tonight on VT Talk. Yes, it's VT Talk as ever was, and in the real telly, via Skype, Clive Bates. Clive, I think most viewers of VT TV will have been following your every move on the blog um, and watching everything that you write. But what what news have you? Have you you got any? Have you gleaned any information from any of the various different uh, authorities and, and and what have you? I think the first thing I'd say, Dave, is that all the effort that everybody is putting in, and uh, I know everybody writes their own letters and may not be aware of what everyone else is doing, but all the signs are that the total amount of pressure that's coming from everywhere in Britain and everywhere around U Europe is actually proving to be quite a lot and quite effective. Um, and it, in the same way that I think... Um, the direct personal input of a lot of people who use e-cigarettes, a lot of vapors, really changed the way the MHRA thinks about this issue in Britain. I think it's starting to change the way MEPs and possibly even the European Council are thinking about it in, um, in Europe. And if there's one thing that we should do, it's not take the foot off the gas. It's basically keep that pressure on. Somebody writes to you, write back. If you've written to everybody, write to everybody else. You know, there isn't, there isn't too much that you can do in this area. They're there to listen and they're there to receive views. And it's definitely paying off. More specifically, um, I, I've had feedback from a number of MEPs that say that the campaign is working. They're finding it persuasive. They're worried about some of the over-regulation of this. Some of the arguments about... Um, over-regulating e-cigarettes gives advantage to tobacco cigarettes. Some of those things are starting to um, hit home. So I would say it's working. Um, we've still got a long way to go, uh, but there's a bit more time yet to flesh out what an alternative regime for e-cigarettes would actually look like. In indeed. And we've gone through the first reading in committee. Where does it go to next after that? <clears throat> well, we haven't actually, we've, we've had the first public sessions. What happens next is the rapporteur, who is um, a British MEP, Linda McAvan, will write her report on the basis of all the um, input she's had. So she's part of this ENVY committee, which is like Environment, uh, Public Health, Consumer Affairs Committee. She'll, she'll write her report and then it will go forward to a first, a full first reading um, in the autumn. Um, and at that point, we'll know what the European Parliament thinks. OK, and that, that's well, we're expecting that to happen in the autumn. It could possibly happen 
before the summer. I'm not absolutely sure about that, whether the timing's clear. But that's the next major development um, in that particular committee. And that committee kind of leads on this issue. But the other interesting thing is that there are other committees of the European Parliament that are getting involved. So there is the jury committee, which is the one that deals with legal affairs. Now, this is potentially very important for um, the uh, kind of e-cigarette world um, because they will look at the legality of what is proposed. And one of the strongest arguments um, that the uh, e-cigarette community has is that it isn't actually legal to define e-cigarettes as medicines, basically for the common sense reason that they're not obviously medicines. Um, but secondly, because there's a whole bunch of European and member state case law that says that when these definitions have been tested, um, the definition of medicine has been drawn quite strictly. Now, that's, one, that's one line to follow. Does, does, that, does the fact that it's been, that, that was Germany and Holland, I think it was, does that bind then the EU? Do they have to then follow what member states have done? Is this part of this whole subsidiarity thing? Well, no. Um, they, but the, what they those those judgments are interesting because they are legal interpretations of what the medicines directive actually means. Okay, so so they 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 don't. They don't bind the European Court of Justice and they don't bind the European institutions. Um, but they are nevertheless what um, legal authorities have determined when they've looked at this. And at the moment, it's three out of three cases that there have been in member state courts have found that it's inappropriate to classify them as medicines. Then the, the, other, the other interesting case is the one that I highlighted on my blog, which is this strange German garlic um, capsule case when the European Court of Justice um, laid down a whole lot of principles in effect about yes. what constitutes a medicine yeah. and some of those principles read over to what you would need to show if you were the European Commission to classify these things as medicines and I don't believe they can um, you have to show that it's there to treat a disease um, that um, you you know you found or you, you know you've, you've regulating these things proportionately and so on. So th those principles um, kind of tell us it will be very difficult for the Commission uh, or the European institutions to defend the classification of um, e-cigarettes as medicines. Not impossible, it's not as clear-cut as the garlic case, uh, but nevertheless very difficult. Yes, um, I, I must admit that when I read through that um I was giggling all the way through because it makes it makes so much sense uh, in that I think everybody knows that garlic's good for you. Yeah. Everybody knows garlic's good for you. Um, but yet it can't be classified as a medicine because patently it isn't. And, and I've always taken the view that if it grows in the ground and anybody can grow it and anybody can eat it and it ain't going to kill you, then it, it's a food, not a medicine. And from that to that degree, I suppose tobacco's exactly the same sort of thing i can see a very very pensive look on sab's face i have the feeling she's got a list as long as her arm of uh, of, of of comments from chat have you i've right. narrowed them down um, <laughs> i'd be here all day if i didn't i'll start with one that, that came in before the show and that was from Suki, and they said today was no smoking day very poor coverage more interested in alcohol what is the hidden government agenda couldn't they have left drink until tomorrow and concentrated on smoking? Are they trying to bury or hide something? Midge Dog has said, um, we still need to keep up with MPs and MEPs. A lot of them still haven't got a clue. Keep on educating them. Mm -hmm. And Agreed. FMRL has, has said, funny thing, this morning was a woman was mentioning that the Greeks are complaining about the directive due to Greek farmers growing tobacco. And there's been a load of comments coming in regarding... Um, the things that were going on today in Parliament and our very own Dave Kitson has said the interesting point for me was that we were awaiting the MHRA report before forming an opinion or so they said we suspected that but now it's been confirmed that's yeah that's pretty much the case uh, Clive did you see anything of what went on this morning or not um, no I didn't actually well part of the reason I was on holiday in Wales but 
Um, so I, was, I wasn't paying much attention to the uh, wasn't paying much attention to the news. Um, I mean, I personally, I think uh, you mean, we're talking about no smoking day. Well, it, 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 about no smoking day, and also um, what happened with Anna Subri in front of the Lords Committee, Committee F. Uh, well, we'll be playing it in after the break. Uh, once you've left us, it does make interesting watching. Um, there may be times when you want to throw something at the screen. I've got to say. Um, but yeah, it, it does make interesting watching. And, and Dave was quite right. Um, she did say right at the top, before she would open her mouth about anything else, that she didn't think she was going to be very helpful because of ongoing consultation matters that meant that she couldn't actually say anything. Pro and the subtext was, because it's a public meeting and we don't want people to know what we're doing. That was kind of what came across. Mm -hmm. How close that is to the truth, I don't know. But uh, you, you say that the, the, or the impression I get is that the MHRA is also responding to everything that we're doing. I assume that's because we've been writing to MPs as well as MEPs and they must have been well, feeding stuff back. No, I think, I think um, I'm actually referring to the consultation that they held in 2010 when they got a huge number of very, very articulate and thoughtful responses from the vaping community that explained in quite personal terms what this was all about and why it was important and they went from having a position where they wanted to see these products regulated and taken off the market within 21 days to being in a position where they stood right back and said we don't want to take useful products off the market basically uh, we get it and now want to try to regulate these products in a, a light touch way. So what they're pressing for is medicines regulation, but with a light touch. Now, I'm very skeptical about whether what they consider to, a light, to be a light touch will actually be a light touch. I think practice. that makes at least two of us and probably another 150 in chat. Yeah, uh, and what they think is light touch probably isn't light touch. And also their hands are tied to some extent. There are some things that they have to do once you regulate something as a medicine that is very different to how you would do it if you regulate it as a consumer product. So, um, and then you've got the effect of all the other European regulators and what happens when they try and get to a, a roughly similar approach. So I, I think, you know, I'm still pretty convinced that um, putting, this, putting these products into a medicines regulatory framework, whatever the MHRA claim, uh, would be a light touch actually wouldn't be good for innovation wouldn't be good for changes in the product wouldn't be good for marketing and wouldn't be good for just getting the the message out and getting the product category to increase at the expense of cig tobacco cigarettes well can, i want to pick your brain on this a little bit uh, especially given your background with ash mm. i i you know i was at this meeting a couple of weeks back talking to a whole load of folks about harm reduction and, and so on and so forth and my feeling, and, and I, this is what I wanted to bounce off you, I think the more authority tries to intervene, the less likelihood there is of people picking up on what they're intervening with, if, if you catch my drift. In other yeah. words, you know, if um, there was a piece on the news about somebody going around with an iPad showing folks... Uh, this is what you'll look like if you carry on smoking in 10 years and this sort of thing and, and scaring folks because they want them to give up. But they're intervening all the time, trying to, to get people to pack in. And, and, and my feeling is that if you, if you stop doing that, if you stop telling people what they need to do and say, look, here's a situation. It's, it's pretty well accepted that smoking isn't good for you. It, there is a, a definite chance that it's going to do you some bad things. But there are alternatives which stand a much, much lower chance of doing bad things to you. You might like to try them. Have at it. Make a choice. Think, which do you think is the more effective route? Well, I think, I think you have to have a bit of a well-judged mixture of the two, to be honest. Um, I mean, kind of um, in this sort of post-war period, Smoking amongst men was about 85%. It was pretty well ubiquitous. You know, almost everybody smoked. And it's come down now to around 20%. So it's, it's fallen a lot through those sorts of campaigns 
uh, to inform, you know, a bit to frighten, a bit to raise awareness and all that sort of thing. Um, it's, I mean, I know this is controversial, but it's, um, you know, bans on advertising, cha tax changes. I mean, there's some evidence that all of these things work and have gradually borne down on the amount of smoking there is. However, I think if you're going to have, if you're going to have an approach that tries to make people want to quit or make people want to stop it in some way, then you've also got a responsibility to do everything you can and make it easy for them to find alternatives. Agreed. Um, you know, I mean, you can't put all the pr all this pressure in the system, you know, high tax rates, frightening messages, smoking bans, bans on everything, um, frightening warnings, you know, on the, on the packs and everything, and then say, well, you know, just quit um, because or actually, die yes quit or die uh, be, because we know that people find it very hard to quit you know the quit rates most people if you if you do surveys uh, and ask people when they expect to quit they'll say um, I think it's about 50 odd percent will say they expect to quit within the next two years and about 65 percent will say they expect to quit within the next five years actually only around three percent or so will quit um, will quit in um, two years. So, you know, you, you actually get... Uh, uh, you, actually, people find it really hard to quit nicotine completely. It does happen, but for many, it takes many years. Well, uh, yes. You, you, I'm sorry you've just thrilled me again. This keeps happening. Um, you, you've actually been the first person that's ever had anything to do with Ash that I've come across that's acknowledged that this... 65% of people wanting to quit actually isn't because I maintain if you want to do something you will do it end of and and the fact that you've um, yeah. confirmed that the that actually it's around about three percent in any two years that actually want to quit and actually do quit well I think that's marvelous thank you bit, well hang on there's a bit more to it than that I mean I mean I think one of the uh, the some very good writing by Carl Phillips on on this, mm -hmm. which he says he says it's basically um, it's an economic decision, and I, I I think and I don't mean economic in sense of money, it's an economic decision in the sense of you weigh up the costs and the benefits, okay, and the costs are you know your long term health, the mess, the expense, and maybe smell and all that sort of stuff associated with continuing to smoke. And then you've got Bennett, you've got costs associated with giving up, which are like you no longer have, um, you know, the mood settling, stress relieving benefits of nicotine. Um, you no longer, um, uh, those, those would be costs of giving up. Or um, you, then, you then also have uh, the cravings and all that. And th the question is, how do you weigh all of those things up? I mean, you're right. If you were to put a gun to somebody's head and say you've got to give up smoking or you get it, they give up smoking. So it is, it's a matter of people, um, when they say they want to quit, how much effort are they prepared to put in and how do they weigh the, the, vary, the costs of giving up versus the benefits of continuing versus the costs of continuing and so on. And so I think that that's what's really going on. And of course, most people say they want to give up um, because actually they would like to. If, it's like I say, you know, I would like to be able to run, um, I'd like to be able to run a marathon. Can I be bothered to get out now in the snow and the rain and do the training necessary? No. Oh, so, I can't blame yeah, you either. Sort of thing, basically. <laughs> no, this, this is what I mean by um, this whole notion of 60% of or 65% of people want to give up. If, if the right person asks them at the right time, in the right way, having given them, in inverted commas, the right information before they ask the question, I can see 65% of people agreeing to anything. Quite honestly, yeah. I mean, you know, I've, as as a, as an interviewer, um, I've done this a few times. I've done it on VT Talk. I've done it in loads of articles in the press and on radio as well. You you you, you pose a whole load of or pose a whole load of pseudo facts. Ask the question, knowing fine well what the answer is going to be. And I, I think a lot of it's to do with that. I mean, you know, I could be wrong, but I'm also noticing a pensive look again on Sav's face which means, again, there's a long list of stuff coming in. Sav, I'll throw it to you. 
I've narrowed it down to just a few again. This <laughs> chat are incredibly talkative today, which is wonderful. Yes. Um, getting back to some things that were brought up earlier. Very boring has said regarding the light touch. Um, he says, I think the light touch should be leave us alone and just let trade and standards deal with these six. There's, sorry, theirs will involve stupidly worded guff. That uh, was very boring words, not me. I, I think he's probably right. Clive, have you got a take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the, if you look at the main risks associated with e-cigarettes, they're, no, they're nothing to do with the impact on the body. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not to do with overdosing on nicotine or getting some weird psychotic side effects or anything like that. And those are the risks that medicines regulators normally take care of, you know. So if we were worried that, you know, using an e-cigarette would cause epilepsy or something like that, then we would, you know, then we would be rightly managing that risk with, um, uh, with a medicines regulator. Mm. As it is, we know what nicotine does because thousands of people take it in unregulated form through cigarettes. The things that, the, the risks that are associated with um, e-cigarettes and e-liquids to do with electrical safety, sort of dodgy plugs and connections. Um, they're to do with things to do with the heating, vaporizing elements um, failing or breaking in some way. And they're to do with the safe containment of e-liquids, which are, you know, potentially if swallowed, poisonous, um, you know, absorbed through the skin. And whatever. Oh, yes. Whatever you do, you must but, you must never, ever leave your e-liquid in the fridge because <laughs> you might just put it in your cook and, <laughs> and, and drink it while you're having a drink one night. But I've, I've got to interrupt you there because I know Sav's got a couple more. Sav? Uh, there's another one that came from Safer Six, again regarding the <coughs> light touch, and he said, license vendors is one way as this would rid some of the cowboy vendors that we've got out there. Well, well, what, what, I've heard this proposal, you know, for licensed vendors, but licensed by who, under what licensing scheme? You know, I mean, you have to have, you know, to have a license, you then ha you have to say... Well, there are some criteria that you have to meet. Then you have to have an inspectorate to determine whether the licensee is um, sticking to the terms of the license. You know, so w would you do it like an alcohol license premises or would you do it like a pharmacy only product? Um, I, I no, think are, are the vendors, uh, is, it the, is it the actual retailer or, or the actual um, uh, you know the the actual suppliers that you would have licensed. I, I think um, this this came from something I picked up down at the uh, at the harm reduction meeting in talks with an insider. I I can't name the insider, who was asking these questions quite pointedly and suggesting that in the way the person was conversing that this might be an option that the MHRA might like to consider. Now I don't know whether that's actually what they're going to do but what we did say or what I said was I didn't think there was a problem with licensing juice makers, juice manufacturers and that it would be very easy to come up with a set of guidelines because they're already there in the food hygiene standards because that's basically what we're talking about. We're not talking about medicinal standards here, we're talking about consumer food hygiene and that falls again for fairly in the purview of trading standards rather than the MHRA. There's also the um, ISETA industry standard of excellence which is basically a, a compendium of all the existing law that applies and an auditing regime to see whether people are complying with it. So well, that's another way of going down the same route. Ab absolutely, I mean the, 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 we've, we've kind of drawn up We've drawn, ACETA has drawn up the framework. All, all that really needs to happen now is that, that authority, government, needs to say, yeah, that looks good, have at it. There you go, trading standards, there's your Bible. If you get a phone call, that's what you need to refer to. It, it yeah. seems so simple to me. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, if you're designing regulation for this, you, what you'd say is, well, if we can get, um, if we can get good, sensible self-regulation where all the industry players form themselves together to comply with this industry standard of excellence, then we'll focus all the regulatory at attention on those that aren't, that don't jo join in with that. Um, we'll have a light touch inspection regime for those that do, and we'll concentrate on those um, that don't. 
And that's a well-established principle in regulation. You, you call it risk-based regulation. The people who don't want to comply with voluntary standards you regard as more risky and you put more regulatory attention on them. But it's the same regulations. It's the same general product safety regulations. It's the same um, you know, chip regulations, the same poisons regulations, same electrical waste, electrical safety standards. It's all the same stuff yes. that governs these products. It's just that you have an industry-led auditing system for making sure that people are complying that gives you better assurance absolutely and i'm, I'm aware that we're running up to uh, the limit of your time with us at the minute clive a, a quick word to everybody that's watching now and will be watching on video on demand where do we need to go now tell tell people what they need to do if whether if they haven't contacted their, their meps obviously they need to but if they have they've had a reply what do they need to do now i think keep Keep the pressure on the MEPs. Um, watch out for news about what's happening. If you've had a reply back that you, you know, you thought was non-committal, or you thought it looked like a standard reply drafted by a party hack, and it's come to you, and it's um, you don't think it gets them, write back. Continue the correspondence. Keep the pressure on. Um, there's, um, you know, you could write to particular MEPs like. Um, Linda McCavan, for example, who is the rapporteur, to make sure that she has your um, your point of view. Uh, she's the one who's kind of pulling all the ideas together at the moment. You could pick out the um, the main rapporteurs. I mean, perhaps uh, tomorrow or something, I'll put a, I'll put up a few suggested um, uh, who the key MEPs are, who are the rapporteurs and shadow rapporteurs. There's also these other committees. So there's the one I mentioned earlier, which is the jury committee, the legal affairs committee. But there's also the um, internal market and competition committee. And remember, this is an internal market directive. It's called IMCO, I-M-C-O. The legal affairs one's called jury, J-U-R-I. These are acronyms. Um, these guys, well, these committees, men and women, of course, uh, these committees will have quite an important bearing on this because they will look at the legality and the single market credibility. They're not just looking at the public health credibility. Remember, this is a single market directive. It's about making the internal market in tobacco and nicotine products function better, taking health as a high, high level of health protection as an objective. So how can it be a high level of health protection when you ban the safest tobacco product, which is snus, and you apply the heaviest possible regulation to the safest nicotine product, which is e-cigarettes, and all you do is mess around with the packaging and flavorings in actual cigarettes. You know, they're not doing the things that would make this a proper harm reduction directive. They're not weighting the balances correctly in favor of the lowest harm products. In fact, if anything, this is working in favor of cigarettes compared to the alternatives. And that, that sounds like a brilliant sentence to include in whatever letter you write to your MEP. That, that is absolutely brilliant. Uh, and, and you're so right. They are promoting the promulgation of the biggest killer um, while stamping on the head of things that will prolong life rather than end it prematurely. Um, Clive, is there anything else that you want to share with us before we bid you adieu for the evening? Um. No, I just think keep up, if you're involved in this and you care about it, um, just keep up the pressure. Um, keep writing to MPs. Um, MEPs, MPs, also very important, okay? Mm. Um, just remember, ask them to write to the Department of Health on your behalf. Um, when, a, when a letter goes to the Department of Health via an MP, it gets treated very differently in the Department of Health and they get a much more serious... Um, you get a much more serious answer. If you're involved in the business of this, um, you know, you're uh, either selling these products as a retailer or you're one of the companies, or whatever, write to the um, uh, department of, you know, biz, the, the business and industry department. You know, they need to understand that this is legitimate commerce. It's health promoting relative to cigarettes. It's generally a good thing for public health. They need to hear that message. And here, um, if you think the regulation is going to be overbearing, which I think you probably find it is if you're in the business at the moment. So 
um, everybody, everybody who's got a stake in the industry as a user, as a supplier, people like me are interested in the public health effects of these these things and how markets can work to improve public health. Everybody's got a stake, and you you know, get onto the MPs, get onto the MEPs, um, learn about the way the process is working, and tailor your responses um, to fit with how it's going. On my website now, so I haven't really publicised this yet. But there is a calendar now of when all the key meetings are happening. So if you go on to clivebates.com, there is uh, there's a button at the top called calendar. And I'm starting to put in then when all the main committees in the parliament are meeting to talk about um, the directive. So it'll give you some idea of critical moments to get your letters in and where you'll be more effective if you if you do it uh, sooner rather than later. Clive, I think you are an asset to the e-cig using populace of the UK and indeed worldwide. Thank you so much for being with us again and I, I really do appreciate it. Um, and I look forward to your return and hopefully with even better news as things go on. But thanks for doing thank what you. you're doing so far. Um, it, it, it's brilliant. Um, I'm going to say thank you for the moment. We're going to go into some adverts and when we come back, it's going to be an extended advert so that we don't interrupt what goes on afterwards, just one in the middle tonight. When we come back, Dave Kitson will be joining us and bringing in your calls, and we will be looking at Anna Subri in front of the Lords. That's uh, here on VT Talk tonight for the time being. I'll see you in two minutes. Thanks again, Clive. Thanks, Dave. Enjoy the rest of the evening. See you in two minutes. Bye. Bye. in Yorkshire for your e-cig needs. That's iVeber.co.uk and iVeber-Elixir.co.uk iVeber and iVeber-Elixir.co.uk Proud sponsors of VeberTrails.tv And we're back in the room and you will see over my right shoulder, Mr. Kitson is there now and the VT talk lines are now open. All you need to do is contact call VT TV via Skype and you can join this discussion on air. It's as easy as that. To give you time so to do and to give Dave time to get the calls all queued up, 
because this is the most technically challenging part of any of the shows we do, I think, isn't it, Dave? <laughs> Just a nah. bit. Doddle. Doddle, says. <laughs> you should see all the technology we're using to get this to work. Have you got that camera on there? I might have. Hang on. <laughs> it's crackers. No. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> We did have earlier. Um, it's, 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 I can, I can. Here you go. There you go. Again. Right, look at this. Right, I'll, let, let me just put oh. that in. Look at all that. That's everything that Dave is using at his end. All of that kind of stuff. Laptop. <laughs> just so that, that people can come in and talk on VE Talk. We've poured thousands and thousands of man hours into this and woman hours, I have to say. So please do call in. Um, and if you don't know what you're going to call in about, let me play this video. If you didn't catch it at 11 o'clock this morning and you haven't seen it on the on-demand stuff that Parliament has, you're going to love this. This is Anna Soubry, the Minister for Health, um, in front of the Lord's Committee F. Don't know what the F stands for. Really, I don't. Have a watch at this. 11 minutes long. 11 minutes of e-cigs in Parliament. For the, the, the inclusion of the, the non-tobacco and nicotine containing products within the proposal. Do you agree that they should be included within the scope of this proposal? Well, we want to make sure that the proposal's approach to the regulation of nicotine-containing products aligns with work currently being taken forward by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Um, um, and certainly, uh, I attended a meeting last week um, with Earl Howe. Um, on this very uh, subject, and we discussed it, as you might imagine, at, at some length and in some detail. So um, I, I don't know whether I could add much more to that, but I mean, we have to. It's, it's, a, it's, it's again, it's difficult and tricky work because one has to accept that for many people who want to give up smoking, this is often a, a very important way that they reduce their um, the, the amount of cigarettes that they smoke, um, with the ultimate aim of giving up completely but it's it's a it's it's about in my view about striking that balance but then there's a there's another argument that is often put into the mix that these sorts of products actually enhance um the acceptability uh, of smoking so there's a lot of there's a lot of balancing to be done with it um but uh, i don't think i'd add anything more in this um, Andrew wanted to add. So I think that just, there, there just is, is one one other thing that I, I would say, um, and, and that is that um, the way that nicotine-containing products are dealt with across Europe um, is is very disparate, yeah. and, uh, and and by including uh, the proposals within this directive, um, uh, it, it will um, seek to ensure a more consistent approach to dealing with with uh, with nicotine-containing products. Um, which, as the minister says, might actually be, be helpful for smokers who, who, who want to quit. Um, if, uh, if you know, if 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 smokers are are, are reassured about their safety, e efficacy, and, and, and quality. Um, and so, in, uh, in 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 that uh, in, in that sense, um, the, the, the UK certainly welcomes the fact that nicotine-containing products have been given some consideration. Um, wh whether or not the, d the detail is right, we, uh, we're still considering. Uh, there is, there is uh, one, one aspect of the proposal, though, that we don't agree with, um, and, and that is specifically about the, the proposed health warning uh, for nicotine-containing products, which we believe is not necessarily evidence-based. Um, the, the, the warning um, is, is, is about nicotine being harmful. And, and of course, we know that the, the majority of harm from smoking comes from the smoke itself rather than from nicotine. So again, we'll work with, uh, with, with, with other member states and with the Commission to find a, 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 a warning that is more appropriate and evidence-based. It is obviously completely contradictory to say that this may assist you in giving up smoking if it's then got a health warning on it. But we also have to put into the mix the fact that some of these e-cigarettes are now being flavoured with bubblegum. And so we have to ask the question, if this was seen as an aid to giving up smoking, why would you need to flavour it with bubblegum? Or are you actually perhaps looking at the fact that it might be attractive to young people um, as uh, s somehow seen as some alternative to smoking, but as soon as you are legally able to buy real cigarettes, you might switch from the electronic bubblegum flavoured to the, uh, the real thing. That, that, that was very helpful. I'll just ask you a quick uh, follow-up question. 
In, in paragraph 27 of the EM, you talk about the research that's currently underway uh, looking at the levels of nicotine that have physiological effects. Can you give us any idea of the progress of that uh, research? Uh, my Lord, I, I can answer that question. The, the, the research is, is, is underway. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware that, uh, that some of the results have been delivered to the MHRA um, and have been shaping MHRA's uh, thinking and policy development um, in, in, in this area. Uh, and, and I guess um, the, the most significant aspect of, of that research is looking at the threshold limits. Um, that, and, and that will inform the, uh, the, the, the discussions that we have on this proposal um, where, where threshold limits are set out as well. So uh, we believe that this research will be uh, informative in yep. terms of the debate about getting the detail of, of, of this aspect of the proposal uh, right. And, and certainly we can, we can provide the committee with more information on the, on the research. We'll ask MHRA for more information and when the Minister writes, we'll, you know, yes. the Minister can include that information in the Thank letter. Thank you. That's very helpful. Very helpful. Ben Catherine and then Lord Richard. We have received some written evidence from a doctor and it seems to be suggesting, if I can understand the scientific figures, that the amount of nic liquid nicotine in the, the e-cigarettes would be insufficient to um, keep smokers hooked on the electronic ones. It's too low. And he seems to suggest that unless the amount of nicotine liquid is in, in, in e-cigarettes is slightly higher or at a level compatible with what a 20-a-day smoker would get, then people will find they're getting no kick from these uh, electronic cigarettes and will all switch back to normal fags. Are your scientists... Do you accept there's some argument there which your scientists are looking at? The level of nicotine uh, gel liquid? Whatever. I mean, the, answer, the, the straight answer is yes. And... Um, for example, there's, a, there's, an, a, there's an, an argument to be advanced that you could actually buy different strengths of nicotine within an e-cigarette um, as part of your programme, okay. your own personal plan, um, to stop smoking. Uh, and we know that many people, I'm an example of it, uh, I stopped smoking not just overnight and going cold turkey, which I would have found exceptionally difficult, if I may say, uh, but I, I slowly reduced the amount of cigarettes that I smoked down and down and down to one, two a day, so that when I finally did stop smoking, uh, I never did stop smoking. I just stopped buying cigarettes and scrounging them from other people. I mean, this, this is meant, you know, these are the sort of psychological games that one plays. But for those people who do want to give up smoking, um, I can see that they may well want to move on to e-cigarettes or supplement them in some way, then move fully on to e-cigarettes and then reduce the amount of nicotine to the time comes when they're actually able to say, I am no longer engaging in this. Is that so, an argument you would make to the EU in your discussions with the EU? Oh, what, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, very much. Uh, well, I would hope so. I've just dropped my official in it. Have you said that again? <laughs> but no, but I mean, you've got to, haven't you? I, I wanted to use the same letter. Actually, it's an interesting letter which we had from a, a Dr. Upton down in Falmouth. You said, out of the blue, the letter came. I today watched with interest the committee meeting regarding the uh, European Tobacco Products Directive. And then he says, I have great detail, scientific evidence, but he comes to this conclusion. Uh, he says, I'm embarrassed to admit I was a smoker myself until August 2012. And then he goes on to talk about e-cigarettes. He said, I tried an e-cigarette at my wife's insistence during July of last year with a full expectation it couldn't possibly work. I made that, that assumption. I made the assumption that with the amount of money that the NHS spends on smoking cessation, e-cigarettes would have been recommended by my own GP had they been safe and efficacious. He then says that uh, he had a sort of a, a Damascus moment, as far as one can see. And then he comes to this conclusion. I'm now convinced that we currently cannot say that e-cigarettes are safe, and we almost certainly won't be able to do that objectively for another 10 to 20 years. However, I strongly believe that the evidence of analysis that I've seen in peer-reviewed documents indicates to me that e-cigarettes are somewhere between 95 and 99% safer than combustible cigarettes and that they may prove to be 100% safe, only time will tell. Now, do, do you share that, uh, that conclusion? Well, I, I couldn't say I did or didn't, because I'm, 
I, I don't have the uh, requisite knowledge and skill expertise to say so. But what I uh, what I would say is that I hope he would share his views with myself, and I'll put them through into the department and into the debate because we clearly are having a debate um, as to what we should do with e-cigarettes. Uh, and no doubt he makes some uh, very good points, uh, good points well made. But, but do you, do you, do you but take the basic point, which oh is yes, that a cigarette is safer than a combustible cigarette? No, no, I, I, well, I, think that, I don't think anybody would actually argue that it, that, no. that it couldn't be anything other. But, uh, Minister, we will give you a copy of this, uh, I would be very which all grateful. members of the committee have had, which I think yes. is an entirely uh, well thought out and very polite exactly. uh, approach. And uh, we will, of course, after we've uh, convinced Dana in um scrutiny, will reply to this gentleman. But I think. Oh, that was a lovely hell round. You'll see Dave Kitson on screen. Dave? How you doing, Dave? Right. If you want to uh, get in touch uh, via Skype and let us know what you think of any of that, or indeed follow on from what Clive was saying earlier in the show. Uh, what you need to do is just simply send the Skype message to call VTTV, like on the bottom of the screen there. And, uh, and what we'll do is I'll call you back and we'll get you on air and you can say your piece. Uh, but please, uh, at the moment that you accept the Skype call, please mute the playback from the video player. Otherwise, none of us will hear what's going on. And it'll all go howling round. Uh, in the meantime, Sav, what have you? Uh, what have you got from chat? I've got loads. I'll just rattle through and tell me to stop if you've heard enough. Um, very boring says bad body language from the start. Sam Munro said, ah, oh, it's nothing to do with medicines. Leanna Lawless says, all about giving up. That's the only way they can call them medicines. Sam again says, translated as protect the children and give us more tax. MJ Jones has said bubblegum is a gateway drug now. Seabiscuit has said... <laughs> <laughs> Can you just, hang on, said, just, just, just before you go hurtling off down that one. I've, no. I've, I've got to have, I've got to come in on that one. Bubblegum flavour. What flavour is Nicorette gum? Given that oh, it's, nice. it's bubblegum is what it is it's bubblegum flavor and they've got blueberry flavor and mint flavor and all kinds of other flavors of the flaming gums and stuff sorry just needed to rant carry on okay sea biscuit has said it's a lesson on how to miss the point on e6 our very own cat says do i need to search out a bubblegum sauce in case i get addicted to blown bubbles with an e <laughs> um, <laughs> Big Craig has said, watching this just reinforces what we're up against with these lovely people. <laughs> is that um, really what he wrote? That's exactly what he wrote, because he's a lovely guy, is Big Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Very boring, says, uh, regarding the programmes that they were talking about, part of my programme is to decide at the time how much I want. Lazy Vapor said, but I don't want to stop vaping Nick, you silly woman. <laughs> Gillis said, it's all quit, quit, quit. Jeff Bennion said, we just switched to E-cigs. Easy. Don't bother cutting down. You chose to stop, not us. FMRL said, classic duck and dodge tactic. And Lord Barbie said, he had to drag that answer out, sorry, that answer out of her regarding safety. That's it. We're done. Absolutely. Uh, did you know something? It, it, this is why you, you, uh, people that watch Vapor Trails TV, anything like regularly, might conceivably get a little bit bored with the number of times that we say, please write to your MP. But you can see now why we need to, and why we need to write to our MPs and get them to spark a letter off to Mrs. Anna Subri, who is a reformed smoker who does not understand harm reduction. She has no notion of what it's about. Her own people in the MHRA, her own people in the MHRA have already said that nicotine is not in and of itself a harmful drug. It's relatively harmless. In the kind of doses that we use, it, it's about, it's equivalent to a cup of coffee. Professor John Britton has said that. So you sit down and drag on an e cig at 24 milligram, 36 milligram, whatever, until you're satisfied, however long it takes, 
And it's about the same as sitting down and having a cup of coffee. The amount of caffeine that's in a cup of coffee, if you were to compare it to the amount of nicotine, if it, I try and il illustrate it, if the tip of my thumb was the amount of nicotine, the amount of caffeine would be like my fist, if you like, to get the same sort of effect. That would be the way it is. And the, 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 she's off our trolley. No, I'm sorry. She's very much mistaken and needs to be educated. And the best way that an MP can be educated is by you writing to yours and have yours be requested to forward it on to Anna Subri. Name her. Name her. Anna Subri, the Minister for Health, with your story and what your objections are to what she says there. Now, I mean, I've got, I've got a fair few answers to what she said. First off, um, anybody that knows me knows I'm kind of a one flavour, two flavours man. That's it. I, I don't mess about with flavours very much, but I know there's a lot of people out there, and Marco Van Basten's one of them, who swap and change flavours all day so that it's, it's still got some difference for them, so that it, it, it keeps them excited, it keeps them interested, and it stops them thinking about going back to smoking cigarettes, because that's the way they want to roll on that one. Dave, how, how, how many different flavours do you use? That kind of thing. Uh, very, very few. Uh, probably about three or four in total. And, and what I tend to do is just use one till I run out of it, then I switch to another one. And then when I run out of that, I'll have got some of the original one in. So I use RY4, DY4, occasionally RY High 5. That's it really these days. But now, Sav, you're a flavour vulture, aren't you? I am now. I never used to be, but I am now, yes. But I've... seriously, honestly, let me ask you the question. <laughs> if, if they were to say, right, you know, Everything else you want, you can have, um, but there's only going to be three flavours, and one of them's tobacco, one's menthol, and one's, oh, go on, I'll say it, Grant's Vanilla Custard. How would you feel about that? I would be outraged. I would be absolutely outraged. Even though I love to have out of those three flavours, not everybody does. I mean, how would you cope, Dave? <laughs> Me? Um... I've got to be honest, I so rarely change flavours that most of the time I probably don't know what I'm tasting, if I'm mm. to be honest. I mean, I only ever noticed the change in flavour in a fag if I'd gone from, I don't know, Lambert and Butler, other cheap cigarettes in silver packets are available, to something like Marlborough, where the difference in flavour was marked, where it was a, a completely different tobacco, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I was never one of these. You could, there's no way anybody could put five different rollies with five different rolly backies in them and get me to identify which one they were. I couldn't have told you. I wouldn't have had a clue. Um, my taste buds were that shot. But what you've got to remember is for nearly eight years, I was smoking 100 a day. And four years ago, when I got onto these things, I was smoking 60 a day. So, you know, whatever taste buds I'd had at the time were probably not only dormant, they'd have been comatose waiting for the uh, the lid to be nailed down on the box, I would imagine. So, you know, uh, the, the, the flavouring thing, even I know it's vitally important to a lot of people. And again, if, if folks are going to be writing to, to their MPs, and, and really, honestly, you should, I think it's, it's well worth making the point that the flavours for you are very important and why they are very important. If it's the ability to change your flavour during the course of the day that stops you from gagging for a fag, for want of a better word, if that's the case, tell them. Let them know. And, and also let them know, you know, you don't have to be six to enjoy the flavour of pineapple or Grant's Vanilla Custard. That's twice I've said it. Gillis will be going off his nuts. Um, <laughs> You know, you know it, 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 it's one of those things. It, it's what really gets to me. But I see we have a call coming in from Jill on Skype. Um, go ahead, Jill. What would you like to share with us? Well, uh, it got me when Anna Subri was talking and they were saying about threshold limits. Yes. Um, and I wonder what they're possibly implying by that. Uh, you know, the, what, the one person did mention about um, keeping levels of cigarettes levels, but it makes you wonder. Well, I don't think it's possible to lower it much further, do you? <laughs> well, I think 
if if they want to bring it down to something down as low as the nicotine replacement patches, it's just going to be a load of rubbish. <laughs> well, yes, I think we already know, and it's been confirmed that uh, NRT the patches were never ever designed to be that effective uh, for whatever reason. And I've got my own theories about that. If if there was to be uh, a lower limit for nicotine concentration in e-juice, Jill, what would you suggest it would be? Well, you've got to you've got to think across the whole board. I mean, cigarettes normally say eighteen on there, or twelve on the lower ones. So I can see them saying eighteen. But then there are people like yourself and a few other vapors that like higher ones. So it's hard to find a good level. Maybe thirty six would be somewhere that would cover most people. Um, I'm thinking. I'm thinking of a number now. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of a number. Um, it's half of one hundred and fifty. Ooh, 75. <laughs> there you go. That would be a brilliant number because that's actually the legal limit for possession. Um, and, you know, and you can mix down from there. If if they set a legal limit of 18 milligram, how the hell are you going to mix down to that? Ah, that's true. I hadn't thought of the mixing part of it. I'm thinking of the finished article. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like the. It was just every so often these things you know you think oh 45 would be fine and then you go hang on no it wouldn't because there are so many people enjoy mixing their own juices so you yeah. couldn't really do that that would be uh, that would be a bit much has that generated any response in chat Sav? um chat they're saying agreeing the same as you with 75 and we've also had a few comments coming in regarding the flavorings and happy vaping said we need different flavors as our taste buds get used to them limit in a limit oh <laughs> so, so, deep, deep breath take a talk and start again <laughs> I'm having word fail today limiting us to three will highly limit us there that's what it said <laughs> I thought custard might have stuck your teeth together there Sav yes. she said custard is that what it is, it is. <laughs> too much custard is it Definitely. We've been infiltrated. That must be it. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, thanks very much for your call. I do appreciate it. Okay, thanks a lot. No problem. See you next thanks. time. Cheers. Right, cheers. Um, I, I suppose really we're getting fairly close to the end of the show. Um, and I, I really need to punt one more thing before we go because it's coming up on Saturday and I'm going to be there and Sav's going to be there and I know Dave's not going to be there but he'll be there in spirit because I'm going to have at least six pints for him. Is that all right, Dave? Yeah, go for it, mate. Good, man. Here we go with my favourite music. I's gonna be there, boys. You should be too at the Sundial in South Shields. If you can't get there, go to Edinburgh. Yes, Gorgie, go, 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 I can never pronounce it. Gorgie Road, Edinburgh. Emporium Vapors. That's what Dave just did. Yeah. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll all be, if you can get to both, that'd be. I had toyed with the idea of trying to drive up to Edinburgh for the start of theirs and getting down for the night of ours. But apparently, when you've had 12 pints, you're not supposed to drive. And you can't go to Edinburgh without having 12 pints. It's the law up there. 16 in Glasgow, 12 in Edinburgh. 8 in Berwick because it's bloody expensive. And that's about us for tonight. Dave, thanks very much for coming in and, and handling the calls. My pleasure. Um, my thanks also, obviously, to Clive Bates. He's a guru. I think he's brilliant, that bloke. My thanks also, also go... Uh, you, it's catching. It's catching. <laughs> My thanks also go to the effervescent loveliness that is Sa Sav and her effervescent sidekick, Daz, who I believe is feeding cheddary stuff to you, and all of the rest of the team as well. It's been a great pleasure to be back with you after my little sabbatical 
last week. And I'm looking forward to being with you all again tomorrow night for the Here's Hour with Daz and Keith. And it'll all be off the cuff because, as Mr Kitson will tell you, there is no way I can film in this house at the minute, is there, Dave? Yeah. It's just a matter of effort. Depends <laughs> how you want to. You heard the noise. <laughs> Every five minutes it sounded like, no, I'm not going to see it. Can I just quickly you know, before you we do go off air, I must say a huge thank you to Kat, who's been brilliant getting all the photos and stuff for this show. She's a star. She is. So I don't have to do it. Yes, she. she I, for I last, should. For the last week, she'd been an absolute star. Sitting, putting all these photos together. She has an eye, you know. She has taste. She S certainly does. Something I am sadly lacking. Um, so, from all of us, from all of the team, everybody included, until uh, until tomorrow night for me and next week for the rest of the VT Talk team. See you night night, everybody. Night night. Night night. night, night. Which is the right button? That one. Bye.